Hello and welcome to the Gooners podcast, where I am all alone this well, almost all alone this morning. But uh, when, when it comes to my compadres Andy and B, uh, it is early morning here in the U.S. And as scheduling would dictate, Amy, it's just you and me. You have me all to yourself. Oh, uh, wow. Welcome, okay. welcome Sorry, back guys. to the podcast, Amy and Lawrence. I act like it's a scheduling thing, but uh, you know they've got 8 a.m. work meetings. They got little kids having breakfast. But honestly, they're just sick of hearing me talk about 1989. I talk about it over and over and over again, and and uh, I think they just kind of bailed on it because they couldn't take anymore. But you and me, Amy, are a little more like-minded. Uh, I think we both kind of can't get enough of the 1989 story, so we're we're glad to have you back on the podcast. Thanks for coming. Absolute pleasure. You're right. I'll never tire of talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew you were something special when I just saw how addicted you are to 1989. And how could you not be? I mean, it, it, if you live through it, which my younger compadres did not, um, you know, you, you you can't stop talking about it. So it's been nearly two years since you were last with us, and uh, a lot has changed since then. Um, as far as our podcast is concerned, we came out of hiding. We started doing video podcasts, which I think was the biggest mistake we possibly could have made uh, because – you know, with Arsenal being a little less than thrilling these days, we end up, you know, bantering about the lack of hair on my head, the extra hair on my chin, and and it's really practically not even about Arsenal anymore. But today, today is an escape from what we're dealing with, and we're going to talk about the glory days. Uh, another thing that changed since the last time we got together is you met your biggest fan uh, ever in the world. And uh, here's a little... Uh, Oh, that can't get the picture lined up. Um, Jelly Murphy. <laughs> that was <laughs> fun. Finally day. met you in Milan. I know that that was probably the highlight of your uh, of your trip to Milan. It certainly was his. Uh, I'm a schmuck because I can't get the the right picture to share. But uh, I feel like we should owe you money for therapy for having an hour of Jelly Murphy trying to push his Denver Gunner scarf on you. I mean, was that <laughs> how uncomfortable was that? <laughs> He really, really, really loves that that, that that Denver Arsenal scarf, that's for sure. No, it was super fun, and I have to say that, you know, when you've been uh, going as long as I have to Arsenal and, and, and you as well, I'm in awe of the people from around the world that get up at stupid o'clock and, you know, they arrange their schedules around um, – inconvenient timings and situations to make sure that they're as up to speed as someone who lives, you know, walking distance from the Emirates. And when I think back to when I first started going to Arsenal in the kind of uh, 70s and 80s, whenever you used to travel around, if you met someone and you would start talking about uh, football in that sort of pre-globalized, pre-internet age, you know, often people really didn't have much of a clue uh, because our information was really limited those days. And if you ever did meet someone who who had even heard about Arsenal, never mind knew any details, it was very cool. And obviously that's changed with the, you know, the fact that the, the fan base is now very, very globalised. And I sometimes resent and, and definitely disapprove of this idea that, you know, somehow you're more of a fan if you physically attend games or what have you, because I think that the amount of caring, the amount of what's in your heart and what's in your mind and what's in your soul, the amount of stupid conversations that you have when you should be talking about something else, um, that's what determines, you know, your, your fandom. And it's not, it's not about geographically where you are in the world. It's about how much you care and how invested you are. And, you know, when, uh, the, the times more recently when Arsenal have been successful, with the FA Cups, when there's a guy actually who you probably know out in America who's put together those videos of people yep. around the world watching. Bryce, I was uh, yeah. I was I was at, I was at Bryce's home pub yesterday, nice. uh, up in Boston. Um, spent some time with with Jeff, who runs the Boston Gooners, and and I will say along the lines of what you're talking about, there were a few kind of traveling, not expats because they live in England, but uh, you know traveling people who were there watching the game. They found out about it online. And I spoke with a lot of them, and, and they're like, I had no idea for a Thursday afternoon midday game that there would be this kind of crowd here, this kind of knowledge here. One of them was a Leeds fan um, who who had a lot to tell us about about what we're what we're facing in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's I think it's a, it comes as a surprise to a lot of people, but uh, you know, it really is it's big. And and the you know the Milan thing 
couldn't have been th more thrilled to to be able to travel to experience a Euro away day because when I lived in England and was following the Arsenal, there were no Euro or away no. days, no. Um, as you know. So uh, that was a thrill, and I know for Joey, it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Joey was telling me years before uh, that that afternoon that you know that you were uh, his favorite writer. That you know, I mean, he bought your books. So I mean, that was a, that was a thrill. So Joey, that one's for you. Um, and we actually won that day. We were all expecting the worst uh, with what was going on at the time, and we uh, we did a two nil at, at the San Siro. So those were the what good old days. To Aaron Ramsey. Yeah, that was probably uh, a sign that we might have wanted to do something better than what we did for him. But uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, Amy, but we're on our second new coach since the last time we potted. I mean, are you are you keeping are you following Arsenal? <laughs> Um, we'll touch a little bit later about your articles uh, on the coaching changes and, and and your gig at the Athletic, which I think is is fantastic. I subscribed as soon as I found out that you and James uh, were going there because you know you don't want to not be able to see the the writing and the uh, the the insight that you have. And you know David Ornstein apparently just walks up to the boardroom with like a, I mean how, how does he get that? I know you're not going to break any information, but I just picture him standing there at Arsenal, just you know with his you're up against the wall. Well, like, because, like, a, like a glass against the wall. You mean. Exactly. Yeah. I mean that. I mean I know that there are more technological ways to spy and to listen in on people, but I mean I, I go for the old cup thing. Um, but between the three of you and and the other writing and and even you know I'm a, an American um, you know, like a NHL fan, an ice hockey fan, and there's really good writing there for for my team for the Capitals. But really the Arsenal content, the football content, is fantastic. So I do want to talk to you about that a little bit later on, but. We have to get to the reason uh, uh, that we're together today, which is, uh, you know, last time we spoke, it was at the American release of the 89 film, uh, the epic fictional drama that is so crazy and unbelievable that you guys should have got, like, script writing uh, Oscars for that. Because, who? I mean, who could think of such a crazy, crazy, uh, you know, storyline? But um, after producing the film... It appears you just hadn't had enough of the whole 89 thing. So we got this wonderful piece of work. Um, and you're not new to writing books by any stretch, but when, you know, when did the idea, did you have that idea right off the, the heels of the movie or, or did it, you know, what, what was kind of the genesis of the 89 book for you? Well, funny enough, Mike, I was in the very unusual situation of, the, the film and the book as ideas were kind of in discussions concurrently, which is a, a highly unusual situation. And uh, I didn't know if either of them were gonna come to fruition, none of them or, or one of them. So I was kind of busily chatting away to people who seemed interested in both the, the film and the book. And um, when, when, it, when it was obvious that there was both kind of offers on the table, there was enough interest in, in producing two versions of this story and from two to to totally different publishers. Um, I really quickly came to the conclusion that if I tried to do both at the same time, I wouldn't probably be here today. <laughs> One and then the other. And the film came first, uh, which was probably quite useful. And in the making of the film, that just summed up even more why doing a book afterwards was a great idea because of the amount of golden material that got cut. Yeah. You know, the, the, the essence of the, the, the guy called Davy Stewart, who was a um, director of the film, he had this really, really clear idea that with a book, you can kind of go off on tangents here and there and come back to the story and drift off and tell some different layers and, and, and buzz around. But if you want people to sit and watch a film and, and, and keep watching and keep gripped, you, he described it as like a train track. You need to get on the train and you keep going and you don't get off until you reach your destination because you have to have this kind of linear way of telling the story. And with a book, you don't need to do that. But what, what it meant was that there were so many fascinating stories and asides and even people that we spoke to that never made the cut of the film, all these layers of stuff that was, you know, w was invisible when it came to the film. So being able to retrieve that and it was like, you know, going through like in the old sort of searching for gold, there was all this gold there and, and bringing that back to life and giving that its platform was fab. And 
it just made me um, realize that what I could do is try and add context in the book. So it's yeah. not like this is the book of the film. They're actually two slightly different animals, and there's, I think, a lot more depth. There was um, just enough overlap. In the film, you're watching it. It's visual. You can see it all happening. You can see the expressions on people's faces while they're um, going through their innermost thoughts. And in the book, there's all this different undercurrents and layers and different people and different ideas and different stories that I think what I tried to portray was, A, this is what life was like in 1989, because we're talking about a completely different way of life oh, yeah. uh, and a completely different way of consuming and living our football. I mean, the, the fact that people could stand up at a football match was, you know, obviously a very, very fundamental thing at, at that time that was hugely influential in that whole era and that season. Um, the fact that, you know, Michael Thomas, who scored the, you know, the historic goal, probably in many ways of Arsenal's history, was earning about £200 a week and sure. lived in a pretty ordinary flat that was much like a, an apartment that, someone who did a fairly ordinary job would have. You know, the players were not um, these different people living in a bubble that seem like a slightly alien species to the rest of us that have to kind of live on a different, a whole different sort of stratosphere. So, you know, there's a million things that made it, obviously not having any social media. So, you know, or, or a mobile phone. Um, I think that was I mean, most people in, that went to that game, you, you know, in hindsight, nobody even had a, a camera. You know? <laughs> so it's it's a different life. Um, how people communicate with each other. If you weren't there, and part of the things I loved was the stories that came in from fans who were anywhere across the world, just trying to ha figure out how they were going to find out what was going on because it wasn't live on TV or radio, or there was no internet for most people to to access it if you weren't in England. Yeah. So it was, it was cool to portray that sense of a different time, different way of watching and, football. And I did enjoy having seen the movie as many times as I have, uh, you know, seeing, reading passages that I recognized from the movie, but then it continued on or seeing the preamble to some of the, the, the passages that I saw in the movie. I mean, again, it just, it, it kind of drew you in a little bit as though you were involved in the making of the movie uh, because you were seeing a little bit of the behind the scenes, which I, which I thought was great. I took the book with me about, about a month ago, uh, as soon as I got it, um, and took it on a trip to Missouri with me to visit my daughter at uni, uh, and I ate the whole thing up in about two sittings. So technical question about how you create a book. I mean, I just assume in this situation that you have like a blank template out there. You start with my essay. And and then you kind of the rest of the book just kind of fills around that. I mean, is that am I kind of propping myself up a little too much there? I mean, is that kind of how it happened? This is kind of pop on the wall stuff. You've obviously been been spying, you know. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, yeah, I've been I've been going up to you. I'm, no, I've been doing this so I could see what your uh, what your process is. But no, I mean, I was I believe me, I was thrilled the second I. Uh, found out that that my essays made the cut and were properly edited so that they weren't. 10 pages of me blabbering on. Uh, obviously, that was still... <laughs> well, hey. um, it was one of the longest, but not the actual longest. <laughs> so the book itself, um, it, it uh, if you haven't read it yet, or if for some reason you haven't seen the 88, uh, you know, the 89 movie, it takes a look through the 89 uh, season, the 88, 89 season, obviously uh, the high point of May 26, through the eyes of the players, the coaches, the team management, uh, but what I find most engaging about the book, and you've made a reference to that, is is you really included the the supporters into the mix in this book much more so than was really possible to be done in the movie. Um, like you said, you've got a variety of experiences running the gamut from people who were at Anfield that day, for people who followed the, the, the team the whole year but couldn't be there that day or were never really likely to ever be there that day. And in the movie, we heard from some supporters, uh, some well-known ones like Alan Davies, um, and uh, you know. But in the book, you've got essays from just tons of people, from our friend Amanda, from me, silly Yanks like me, uh, and it just really added to the whole experience of you know, hey, this is this wasn't just me suffering through this or or you know living through this. It was a lot of other people, and and you know, especially with what's going on with Arsenal right now. I keep coming to this, but. You know, this is an escape where you can just remember what Arsenal Football Club 
really means to people uh, and how different it is then to, to how it is now. So definitely pick up the book. I don't want to spoil the book, but there I, I want to tell you about my favorite parts of it. There were a few things as I read through it that I was like, you know, oh, I've got to remember to talk to Amy about this because this just either makes me laugh or is especially poignant. So uh, there's about five or six areas, and, I, and I'd love to get your feedback on, on any background you have on those things. Sure. Um, first, just kind of a statement from me, which is the film does at the very beginning cover George Graham's arrival, uh, how he kind of overhauled a team with some wily veterans that you wouldn't have thought would have been cast off um, and replaced with young kind of second division players, if you want to call them that, uh, at the time. And and for a guy like me who discovered the club in August of 1988, uh, it was already beyond the days of Viv Anderson, of Kenny Sansom, Champagne Charlie, and and all of those guys. So it was fascinating not just to kind of see the, the starting 11 with the replacements, which was a really cool visual in the movie, but to learn a lot more a little about the day, you know, the years that led up to 1988-89, and the book does that. So uh, that was one thing I enjoyed. <laughs> a funny story in the book, uh, Lee Dixon, who I know you worked really closely on in, in the movie, with in the movie, um, talks about his early meetings with George Graham when he was still at Stoke. And uh, apparently his manager at Stoke, Mick Mills, gives him the impression that he's about to make a big money move to Arsenal to get on one grand a week, a thousand quid a week. Um, and he overplays his, his, his hand a little bit with George Graham and wants to pay him 500 um, and uh, almost blew his his shot at Arsenal, which is uh, it's pretty interesting. If that had, if that hadn't happened, we might not be sitting here talking about this event today. We might not have the whole history of the club. But uh, amazing in an age where Mesut Ozil apparently, and I've heard this from you know, apparently he makes three hundred fifty thousand quid a week, um, and two hundred quid or five hundred quid nearly cost Lee Dixon his spot at Arsenal. So. Yeah, but, but not only that, if you think about the reality of it, he got in the car. It's the same as like, um, you know. Sounds like a drug deal almost. Was he got in the car with his manager at Stoke and drove down to the service station that was about halfway between Stoke and London, while George Graham drove the other way and they met in the car park. And Lee <laughs> got out of the Stoke manager's car and got into George Graham's car and sat in the passenger seat and they had a chat about, you know, whether or not he wanted to sign no agents you know no middlemen yeah, no, no one, just the manager and the prospective the, player the, sitting in his car i mean what were the people that own 30 scenario of to be in especially the guy like george um and and you know lee did make a mistake about about the money he was only acting on the guidance of what he'd been told but I think he was mortified. George Moore, let's just go out the car and said, this conversation's over. And he was like, I mean, it's a, an extraordinary thing, but it sums it up. Wasn't that, it wasn't sums that Lee Dixon was greedy. It was that he had he been misled. Greedy. He didn't have a clue. He didn't have an agent. He had been misled. Yeah, that, that's and, the part that kills me. You know, he was way out of his comfort zone. He was like a 22 year old guy who, who played football all his life and all he did was go out there and do what he was told by his coaches and play football and suddenly you know he was in charge of of this situation and um but george knew what he was doing he knew full well that it was a kind of game and that lee would come come begging the next day which he did and uh and they got the deal done pretty quickly but it it also tells you something about what george did and i think this is a fascinating element and when you look at coaches and you look at management in a way, it's interesting when you look at today's current situation where you've got a group of players, some of whom probably think they're better than the situation that they're in and might be on the phone to their agents today or yesterday at the end of the game, you know, wondering where else they might uh, might end up because they think they're probably too good for this. Hey, hang on a second. There are actually the reasons why this situation at Arsenal is what it is. Um, but, you know, George Graham when he first became a coach, had a, a real impact straight away working with young players. And he realized that with young players who hadn't done anything yet, they listened to him. They did what he wanted them to do. And when he got to Arsenal and had a look around and saw a few, you know, quite experienced internationals who'd been there, done that, you know, quite full of themselves, he wanted to work with people who were going to listen to him. Uh, who weren't going to challenge him, who could be moulded. So the people that he identified, like Lee, like Nigel Winterburn, 
um, like Steve Bold, like to an extent Brian Mould and Alan Smith. Kevin Richardson was a more experienced guy, but you know, still had not achieved. He, he wasn't like a world beater. He wasn't, a, you know, an, an, a, a, someone who was a, a big time Charlie. He got people in who were going to listen. I love how he gets and described in the by, him. Though, by his teammates. I love how Kevin gets yes. uh, described. I mean, he's, he's kind of a real complainer. It's it's, it's fantastic. Well, Do everything's got to have a complainer, let's be honest. Not 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 to, to to drive off into today's arsenal, but do you not see I, I I'm looking at I, I've looked at lists of the of the Arsenal squad ranked from oldest to youngest. There is a line of demarcation at the age of twenty-five uh to where I almost see this as being exactly like thirty years ago, where there are very few players above the age of twenty-five that I think are beyond, are not beyond the point to where they think they're too big for the club. Uh, I mean, there are some exceptions, and Bern Leno is completely exempted from that. Uh, but the players under age 25, for the most part, are the ones who kind of have shown the most hunger when they've been given the opportunity. They're the ones that have the most familiarity with Freddie. You know, it's, it's an extreme thought process, and you have to kind of agree that, top four is gone for the season in order to buy into this, but uh, you can make a starting 11 out of, out of players 24 and younger with Arsenal right now. And I'd be more excited by seeing them try and, and come up short than I would about seeing what we saw yesterday. Just a little editorial comment. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but uh, you know, there are always some exceptions. I know Obama Yang's over 25, but if you're just going to, if you're going to wipe the slate clean and do kind of a, a George Graham, uh, there's a line of demarcation that's pretty strong at age 25. I think um, it certainly feels like something is quite broken at the moment at Arsenal and to the point where it's hard to know how to fix it, which is a humongous challenge for Freddie. I mean, to be in your first job um, and be walking into a, a, a dressing room where probably every player is feeling... Um, Upset, cross, underconfident, blaming others. Really uh, a complicated environment. And, and you've got to be super brave to do that. And I think probably Freddie would need some support from on high if that's the way he wants to take it. When you look at his first couple of team selections, obviously he's you know, got a lot of faith in, in, in Joe Willock, who very much is his protege, but he has tried pretty hard to give most of the older and more experienced guys, um, you know, starts and responsibility. And that tells you that he wants to get them on side as a way of trying to mend the dressing room. But if it doesn't work, I mean, I'm scratching my head in a way thinking what kind of team can he pick? On Monday night that's going to be different to the last couple of games uh, in terms of um, the amount of determination and motivation and work and attitude and, and, and desire to really make a difference to how things have been and you, you could argue chuck the young players in but then Freddie's got to walk into that dressing room and deal with yeah. five members of the squad because yeah. there's nothing that, that that squad isn't changing until at the very, very earliest January. And even so, how much is it going to realistically change in January? Not a ton. So this is what he's got to work with. And somehow he's got to manage the whole. If the people upstairs, if Edu and Raul and all those guys say, Freddie, you do whatever you want. You want to pick a youth team? Pick a youth team. You know, no problem. Uh, we'll back you if you want to go and upset a whole bunch of experienced internationals. Um, but I, I like he's getting experience that internationals is, is your word that's a massive call yeah well you know it, it just kind of it entered my mind when I when I re, you know revisit what George Graham did and yeah it's a lot easier to do that and he did that I believe over the course of summers not in the middle mm -hmm. of November and December exactly. um, but uh, I think I think our club could use a little bit of that Back to 89, uh, page 94 gives me a laugh. Tony Adams uh, just casually recalling a moment where he's in, in the bath with David O'Leary. 
after the match at Millwall. And that's when O'Leary first says, you know, I think we might be able to win this thing. Um, and it reminded me of the time that my co-host Andy and I were in a bath together. And, and he, you know, he comes up with this crazy idea. He's like, I think we can get an interview with Josh Kroenke this summer during the tour. And believe it or not, that happened too. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I mean, you know, good ideas come out of taking baths with, with other men, apparently. Um, <laughs> I comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't going to come to you for that one. Um, page 80, Alan Davies, uh, as we, we referred to him earlier, creator of the Tuesday Club, hilarious guy, uh, Arsenal through and through, talks about watching a game at Wimbledon, uh, the first game of the season from the old plow lane, um, and how the view from the terraces was such shit that the best place to watch the game was from the toilet. Uh, so that people would go into the toilet and, in his words, urinate for 45 minutes <laughs> and then take a break during halftime and go back. I, I mean, I just, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, of like a porta pot, which, uh, you know, I don't know what they call them over there, porta johns, you know, the, the single, the most disgusting experience you could have in your life. But he's probably talking more about, you know, like a stadium toilet. Uh, that isn't just, you know, you in there by yourself in an enclosed environment peeking out through the thing. But, um, you know, is that why they uh, they left Wimbledon and kind of uh, and, and went to Milton Keynes? Because if the toilet's the best place to watch the game, it's probably not a good sign. <laughs> well, that's not why they left. That's a longer story. But, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's funny because – that's what football grounds used to be. Oh, there it is. That's what they used to be like. Um, very uncomfortable. Uh, you, you wouldn't expect to have a, 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 a good view, a good toilet. I mean, all the things that are advertised now to be so wonder about, wonderful about modern football stadia, none of that existed in, in places like Plough Lane, which is what gave them their special character, which is why... You know, I loved going to all those weird little grounds. Oh. Everyone had their own soul. Everyone had their own special character and personality. And you knew wherever you went that this was somebody's place and it was representative of them. And to an extent, we've lost that with the kind of mega bowls that are the majority of kind of newly built stadia. Uh, and it's something I think that Arsenal is still suffering from in the sense that it is very comfortable at the Emirates. I'm not sure how much that's a great thing. Uh, I'm not sure the relationship between the fans, the club, the players. Um, yeah, I felt like a little bit of Arsenal's soul was kind of lost forever when when they le left Highbury, and it's 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 tough. I mean, you can't you can't recreate that that kind of thing um, no. overnight, you see, even over a long period. Even with a winning team, you know, uh, I'd still say that like, Man City fans who have obviously watched their team win like mad in, in recent years, which wasn't the case for a long time at Main Road. But where was the experience they preferred? I bet most people would say Main Road. And I know some uh, some West Ham uh, supporters that feel the mm. same way. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of planning a trip uh, over, and I'm coming over again in uh, in, in March for another one of my lengthy sojourns uh, for football. One of my favorite things to do is about a month to two months prior when all the television selections are made and the game dates and times are finalized is to look at the off days when Arsenal aren't playing and figure out which second division, third division, Vanarama, I'm not even kidding. I usually make a trip to Sutton uh, to, to see a game there to, because I just love seeing the other stadia and Going to you know non Emirates places, Selhurst Park was always one of my favorites until some of the nightmares we've had there recently. But um, and uh, yeah, the toilets there are not easy to get in and out of. <laughs> They're pretty; it's pretty tight quarters. Um, so uh, I can imagine. I never made it to to see a game at Wimbledon, but uh, uh, I certainly saw a game where Wimbledon came to us, which is part of the '89 story. Uh, Perry Groves makes a comment, and we talk about the difference between, again, football in the late 80s and football now, um, and it's especially pointy, because whatever you think of, the, and I don't want to turn this into a discussion about the whole mascot gate situation that happened last weekend with the video of the players, which turned out to be half the story, but um, he talks about how back, in, you know, back then and the coach on the way to the ground in the dressing room, uh, coaches were talking to players about specific game strategy. Dicko would talk to Tony Adams about spacing, 
Merce and Smudge would be talking about their strategy when the ball gets played through, and it was just constant chatter, constant preparation, constant information being shared. And, you know, today every player has headphones on. They avoid eye contact. Um, and I know I know that our, our connection is getting a little spacey here, but are, are you hearing what I'm saying right now, Amy? You, I, I didn't catch that last one, sorry. Just, just, about, again. just about uh, what, what Perry Grove says about the, the, the headphones now and the fact that there was so much mm. chatter and communication and game strategizing going on in every element of the pregame routine. And now it's just, it's players walking with their heads down and headphones on. Uh, how can you have a team concept when you have players that are just so siloed and, and closed off like that? That's, you know, that that's an aggravating element of today's game. Look, it's modern life. I mean, you see in, in you know, you, you want to sit around the dinner table with your kids and they want to look at their phones. I mean, we're, we're you know, it's part of the way society has changed and everybody has to adjust with it. And, you know, you see sometimes teams uh, with all their fines, uh, you know, and it says if you've got your mobile phone out in the dressing room, it's, you know, this much or, or I guess the headphones and stuff. It, it's it's complicated. And I think that we you know, end up romanticizing what it was like when everybody would sit together and chat and play cards on the coach for four hours or have an eating competition <laughs> or... Um, you know, whatever they would use to get up to. But I think the point that Perry made that was most fascinating was it's not just the social side of you'd be sitting together for four hours on a bus, so you're, you know, you're having a laugh with your mates rather than closed off. But it's the fact that they would sit and talk about the game. Yeah. So, you know, he said Lee Dixon and Tony Adams might be sat next to each other on the bus and talking about the fact they're going to be up against a particular winger. And if this guy's got the shuffle across with you, Baldy and Angel are going to come, and they would actually be discussing what they were facing on the way yeah. to the game. Now that's, you know, that's just a sort of, it's a double-edged sword where it's football that you're talking about and the game, but also you're in it together. You know, you know that someone's got your back because you've talked about it. Yep, yeah, and, and that, uh, it's it specifically the game strategizing, having the coaches be able to come up to you and say, you know, this is something I noticed. I mean, I know there's meetings and, and opportunities to look at film and, and that sort of thing, but the, you know, pregame is when it matters the most, I think. So uh, one of my favorite supporter essays in the book was from a guy named Aaron Bates, who starts off by saying he was in his mother's womb uh, during the game at Anfield. And... Uh, I was expecting the rest of it to be like I could hear the game through the <laughs> through the wall and uh, and, and I, I got nauseous when my mom was jumping up and down at the end, but it really wasn't there. But I, it's it was still kind of a funny um, a, a funny uh, essay from him. But so one thing that really struck me was just the incredible class that Liverpool supporters, Liverpool management, players, everybody showed in the wake of that defeat. I mean. I've got to think that kind of the perspective of Hillsborough in that situation had something to do with, you know, perspective and how you handled that. But just I don't know that I could have expected uh, our team or any part of my life that I'm in to have a crushing loss like that and, and show that much class and grace. Uh, I mean, the fans clapping Arsenal off for their performance and their achievement at the end of the game. Kenny Dalglish going to see the ref, David Hutch Dave Hutchinson, to – to bring him champagne at a time where he was still massively concerned that he had screwed up the entire league championship by allowing Alan Smith's goal uh, and letting him know that he was right. Two players I could not stand at the time, Bruce Grobelar and, and Peter Beardsley, bringing Liverpool champions 1989 champagne to the Arsenal dressing room. I mean, just so much class in a situation like that that it really shocked me to find that out. And, and was that, a, a, again, a sign of the time, or were these just uh, – was this just a special moment that deserved that kind of a reaction? It was 100% a sign of the times because football was grieving and Liverpool as a city was grieving and they were reeling from a tragedy that is still being felt today, 30 years on, in that city and at that club, um, which had happened six weeks previously. So it was so fresh and so raw and they were so in the middle of this, uh, this massive trauma that I think your regular emotional reactions to things just 
get put to one side. And I, I think it allowed probably uh, the people of Liverpool to absorb the match in a way that they wouldn't normally. Um, so there, I don't think were particularly recriminations or, or, or anger and even the kind of sadness that they might ordinarily have felt about football. It was a totally different yeah, scenario but, for them. But, but it, it, it did create, and I, that's one, I think that's one of the reasons why it still resonates and means so much today to people of Arsenal, because not only did it, did it mean so much because Arsenal won the league for the first time in 18 years and it was the most dramatic finish in the history of football. But everybody who was there or was a part of it or was watching it live who had Arsenal in their hearts knows that it was something extra extraordinary because of what had happened at Hillsborough. And I felt it personally myself. Um, I think some of the Arsenal fans kind of, it was you, you wrestled with it a bit and some of the players did to an extent, although they were in that... Um, blinkered world of just you know trying to be professionals and, and get on with their job but it wasn't an easy one to go up there and think well of course people want Liverpool to win because you know maybe they should because of what happened at Hillsborough but yet obviously there's and a you almost feel like you're adding insult on injury you you loved Arsenal and it was you know you've been waiting for years and to have this kind of em emotional feeling yeah you, you can you... it was a very very unique uh, environment and I I remember my own things that stick in my mind from that night is in the midst of the celebrations where you're having this moment of communion with your people with your fans and your players and you know George Graham and all the guys coming out and lifting the trophy and it was like a surreal otherworldly kind of moment of bliss that you never thought you'd feel and a couple of guys came over from the cop and ran down in front of us and unfurled a flag and it said something along the lines of for the 96 who died at Hillsborough this one's for you I think it might have been nine uh, uh, and and the Arsenal fans started to sing you'll never walk alone oh, man. and it was it was kind of mind-blowing it was it's difficult to articulate how that felt you know the the kind of combination of of emotions that you felt like that at one time that were all kind of pumped up to intense levels that are so far removed from your normal experience. It was remarkable. And then by the time the fans, the away fans had had 45 minutes or so of celebration and we got kind of turfed out and went back to our coaches and everyone headed back to London to celebrate, there was a couple of hundred Liverpool fans waiting outside. They'd waited 45 minutes uh, for, for the opposition fans to come out and pats on the back, shake hands, well done. I kind of was like, what? Like, and a guy, I can see his face to this day, 30 years down the line, a Liverpool fan came and took my hand and we swapped scarves. I've still got that scarf he gave me. So you took I his scarf? Keep it forever. Cause it you took his scarf. You, 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 you wouldn't take Joey Murphy's scarf, but you took his scarf. I see how it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get Joey about this forever, aren't you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but that, that is incredible. I mean, you can really, it, w when when there's that much raw emotion and context to, to a situation, you can really go in one of two ways. One, I think, which we'd probably see more today would be uh, anger um, and just raw frustration, although the context of Liverpool winning everything in sight other than that game probably helped a little bit. But And the other is just perspective. I mean, I, I remember uh, in 2009, I, I came home one day, from work to find two inches of sewage in my finished basement on covering the base of couches and walls. And I mean, it was disgusting. We had a massive backflow and, you know, I normally would have absolutely lost my head over that, except I had found out earlier in the day that my dad's chemotherapy hadn't, uh, hadn't been effective and, and his leukemia was terminal. So, you know, when you, when you're dealing with one tragedy and something else, that's just kind of like not the same, level of you know it puts things in perspective so not a direct comparison to anfield 89 necessarily uh, other than the fact that we have been watching games from toilets we've been talking about that but still yeah i i just it, it really struck me how much class there was from everyone involved at liverpool uh in that in that moment um and of course speaking of class the end of the book uh just as uh, in the end of the movie um 
a poignant nod to my favorite Arsenal footballer of all time. Um, and I'm going to try to put him up on the screen here. Um, David Rocastle. Uh, what a universally loved man. Uh, we've enjoyed having guests on our pod who knew him, played with him, Alan Smith, Kevin Campbell, uh, anyone else who ever came across Rocky is wax is poetic about the man he was, not just the player he was, uh, beyond even, you know, just the results on the pitch. And and how is it, Amy, that he does not have a statue outside the Emirates? Mm. I mean, I don't want to put you in a weird position, but I'll put myself in that position. That's a crime uh, because, more, more, you know, he was he was the Arsenal way uh, yeah. beyond the fact that he was very good for us and brought us uh, brought us trophies. So uh, I'm going to build one there in March when I when I visit. So, you know, anyone who makes ingredients for statues, I don't even know how you do that, but please give them some. But uh, I, I appreciate you ending the book with, again, uh, you know, with Rocky's legacy, just as uh, as Ian Wright ended the movie with it. Yeah, well, I mean, he was the embodiment of everything that Arsenal was trying to be back then. Um, he acted like he was one of us. I think that's why fans identified with him in a particularly special way. He had this phenomenal uh, mixture of, you know, the maximum determination you want a footballer to have. He had it and then a bit more. Plus, he was more skillful than virtually anybody that you could watch in those days. Mm. And he married those two elements. And what more do you want in a, in a footballer than someone who cares, someone who knows where he came from, someone who wants to represent everybody, who's proud of it, and who plays like a dream with fight to boot. I mean, he was a, and as, as you rightly know, from, from his teammates like, like Alan and Kevin from those times, he was a fantastic human being. Um, and, you know, that's always why. the first to reach out to a new player to make them feel at home. Just, you know, not, not Johnny big balls, just, just David and Yeah. He was, uh, yeah, I the agree the statue, by the way. Um, yeah, it's an omission and, and, and I hope one day that gets put right. Excellent. And, and, um, so, that, I mean, those are my favorite parts of the book. There's so much more in there. Um, where, tell us where we can find the book. I mean, obviously it's on Amazon. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you get books shipped directly to you from uh, from the author. Uh, but uh, for, for anyone who isn't as lucky as, as uh, and, and I'll mention why that was in just a second, but uh, anywhere else you'd uh, prefer people to look for the book? or, well, or Any local bookstore where they can, you know, where anybody can find it brilliant be my guest uh, otherwise all the usual um, massive corporations that they're paying our tax but they do send you goods um yeah just, uh, hopefully take 95 percent of it find somewhere that you can grab it if, you, if you'd like to see more uh i hope you enjoy it well and and from the bottom of my heart uh thank you for being one of the amazing folks who, who donated your time uh you donated books you personally signed uh three books for for gooners versus cancer that raised, you know, each of them raised uh, over $100 for, for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, helped us towards just a, a crazy good campaign this year where we raised over $16,000. That's for, Congratulations. For, and, and, and that, you know, we hope to do it all again next year. Uh, I had to buy one for myself. Joey absolutely loved your message for him and his. Um, you know, I think uh, for the next book, we're going to we're going to up the price quite a bit because uh, it's worth every penny. So it's it's great to have the support of people like you, like Kev, like like Smudge, uh, the team itself. Uh, there's a really special kind of grand prize next season that I'll be talking about later for uh, for our raffles that uh, that's going to be pretty insane. So looking forward to that. So briefly, I know we've, we've got about five minutes left to chat. Um, How's it going at the athletic? Uh, uh, just an outstanding. It seems to me like an outstanding and a well-deserved opportunity. Maybe it's like a, you know, they're, it's like a slave camp where they force you to write articles you don't want to write. I could be completely wrong, but it seems like well, a good they thing. They pins in us if we don't get. Yeah, yeah. Good words. forced yeah. acupuncture is never good, but it's um, do you know, it's a, a funny thing, but one of the one of the things that really struck me was when. Uh, when they first came to, to, to chat to me and said, look, 
what we're trying to do here is is get away from the kind of everyday match reports, press conferences, the stuff that, you know, your bread and butter that, that most, uh, football reporters are, are doing all the time. Just go and do interesting stuff, find different stories, talk to interesting people. And then the magic, magic words, they said, you don't have to go to any press conferences if you don't want to. Now, that being after a full season of Unai Emery press conferences, where the amount of times that I thought, I don't think I can listen to any more of this. <laughs> It was just like, whoa, <laughs> where did this? I've, I've, funny. I went to one Unai Emery press I've, conference. I went to Wonka Bar and I've got the golden ticket. Someone's actually saying you can be a football reporter and you don't have to go to Unai Emery's press conferences. So it felt like too good an opportunity not to try. Um, and it's uh, 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 the things that have changed for me personally is obviously I'm now kind of almost exclusively an Arsenal correspondent, whereas in my previous uh, work, Although I did a lot of Arsenal and it was always a speciality, I did do other stuff as well. Now, you might say that that's a bad thing at the moment because, God, it would might be nice to have a break from this. But um, <laughs> Can I know. please go cover Leicester City for a few weeks? <laughs> the, the, the upshot is that, you know, if you spend um, a, a, lot, a long time around a club, you get to know lots of people and you get to, to really try and feel the nuances of what's going on. So trying to use... Um, that knowledge and that enthusiasm and that passion for a club uh, and the people there to try and tell the stories as best you can. You know, there's pros and cons about being sent to cover someone outside of your comfort zone. You know, it can be refreshing and different, but it can also be like, do I really know what's going on here? Or am I kind of guessing because the fans know everything? So you don't want to be a schmuck that doesn't actually know what they're talking about. So at least when I'm on home territory with Arsenal, I, I like to think that I'm as nerdy as the next person. So ho hopefully uh, that, that stuff is all in there. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to have that freedom to try and uh, look beneath the surface and get away from traditional deadlines. And hopefully that's reflected in, in some of the work, which is just, you know, an opportunity to, to try and get as much in depth, Arsenal coverage as we can, thinking about things more than maybe is possible when you're just worried about the next press conference and the next deadline. Yeah, and, and it shines through. I mean, it's a different kind of writing. It's a different kind of, of access uh, and, and the behind the scenes. I mean, the most, uh, not the most recent, but among the most recent articles posted was a redo, uh, kind of a repost of an article that you, David, and James all wrote uh, about six weeks ago about how Freddie Youngberg was being groomed and well on his way to being a uh, you know a, a top or a good choice for for you know for the big job um, I wouldn't say little did you know because you probably had a sense but uh, not too far after that article is posted of course he's in the job now um, so I mean it, it's an interesting look it does kind of make you feel better about Freddie despite what we've you know seen in his limited opportunities to really start turning this around um, but you know, as it relates to that, I'd be remiss if I didn't get your feedback and, and perspective on kind of the state of the club beyond what we spoke about earlier about, you know, the, the player ages and going with youth. Um, you know, for, for those of us who, like, immerse ourselves with Arsenal, every bit of news, drama, it, it's just, it's something that I personally feel like I need to kind of start turtling and getting away from and just escaping and letting things just happen instead of being so immersed in it. And I, I know that I'm feeling that way right now, but are you able to, as an Arsenal supporter who's watching what's going on right now and reporting on it and kind of having the unique position that you do, are you able to take a more global kind of semi-detached look to the extent that is necessary not to go into a loony bin? I mean, is yeah, your view I, of it any I, more favorable? Or? Straight in there, um, more about <laughs> bashing the door down. Uh, I, the game, as we're speaking last night against Brighton, Brighton. <laughs> really shocked me, actually. And, you know, when you've, when you've been watching a club for, you know, ups and downs of 30 or 40 years, you, you like to think you've seen most things. But I think what really worried me was just looking at, the overall picture and 
most of the time in the ups and downs of you know your football supporting life you've got opinions you think this is what they should be doing maybe they should try that you're talking about the young players you're talking about maybe changing the, the, the you know the, the manager when it when emery went and whether that should have had a previously and and who they might be getting or looking at to try and sort it out whether it's ready for a longer period or, or whether they're getting somebody else in you know, there's usually things you can think they should be they've got to buy a centre half in the next, you know, transfer window, or they've got to change the manager, or they've got to do this, or they've got to do that, or get that one out of the team, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I literally found myself sitting there thinking, I don't know what to do. There's no, we we keep changing little thing. We keep saying, okay, well, it's the ownership. Okay, well, the owners didn't make the players play the way they did yesterday. All right, so it's the players, but. It's the same players that did better at the beginning of last mm-hmm. season. So maybe it's the coaching, but we've changed the coach. I mean, there there seems no way out. And uh, I've just wondered whether you have that, you know, that same view of it while you're, you know, while you're still in the position of passing along. Uh, I mean, the only thing I do feel is that, you know, you watch enough football in your life that you know how quickly things change yeah. and how sometimes they change on the weirdest little things. And I guess I'm clinging to the idea that, <laughs> With a bit of luck, at some point in the not too distant future, something runs for this group, because it feels like whether it's whether you want to blame the players or the environment or uh, the people picking the teams or the owners or whoever or the fans or, or whatever, probably everybody's playing a part, even if it's unwittingly. You know, the ground. This is Freddie Umbo's first home game. The ground's not full. They don't sing his name. I mean, I know that. It's you know not the fans' responsibility to, to 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 drive and people react, but you know you can help too. Yeah, was everybody just- everybody holds uh, some of the blame, and the problem is yeah. that everybody that holds the blame wants to blame other people for one hundred percent of the. Yeah, blame. the environment is is tricky at the moment because everybody is you know everybody's on some level not you know it's not 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 a it's not a great scenario and people people I don't know whose responsibility it is. To, to, to help get get Arsenal out of this mess, but maybe everybody can try and do something a bit more positive. Who cares about this club? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just hope something runs for them somewhere along the line to 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 flip this 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 negativity. Well, the one thing I will be doing is no matter how much I detach myself from the day to day and the media and all that and social media, not your kind of media, mm-hmm. um, the. Uh, I will be there for when it does turn around uh, and I'll be there until it turns around. And I think every, every Arsenal fan ultimately uh, would say the same thing. And I can't think of a better way to, to, you know, to cap things off than that sentiment. Um, Amy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 89, the book, please go out and get it. I even saw, I think there's an audio book uh, version of it. Yeah, Alan Davis just reads the audio book. So. Oh, he reads, okay. I was wondering if he read the whole thing or you, Oh, that's fantastic. So, mm-hmm. Um, so get that if you want to listen to it in the car. If you're listening to us um, on your iPhone or some audio uh, device, hi-fi stereo, uh, eight-track cassette, reel-to-reel, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, at Go- uh, You can go to www.goonersubscribe.com. Um, all of our content is on there, including, uh, by the time you're hearing this, the uh, – uh, the the video and the discussion that we had today with Amy Lawrence. You can catch all of our other podcasts with, with people like Amy, James McNicholas, Alan Smith, Super Kev, and, and, and many, many more. Stuart McFarlane was on this year. Uh, and keep, uh, keep posted for next week where we should be releasing a discussion with recent uh, American Arsenal trialist Cole Bassett, um, who is uh, who's, who. Andy, my co-host out in Denver, has known since he was just a little, little, little pup. So uh, that should be interesting to hear his perspective. So uh, thank you again, Amy, for joining us. I appreciate your uh, your willingness to work with our schedules. And, of course, we're always happy to work with yours. I'm glad it's, it's so packed and busy. And uh, with that, I will wish you a wonderful weekend. Cheers. Thanks, thanks for joining us. And come Bye. on, beginners. <laughs>